my early memories or any memories I do have of my childhood is from Samoa. And so my parents always made it very um, clear to me that I was lucky to grow up in an island. Um, and so we would like watch the news and see how, you know, other kids' realities look so different in war-torn places or in places of famine. And I always just felt like my island home was something that I was privileged to have. And so when I heard about this thing called climate change, it was like the biggest concern for me. Okay. So, so at what age did you start learning about climate change? Because I grew up in the islands too. So I was there from a very young, well, I was born here, but then migrated back to Tonga with all my parents and pretty much lived there until I was six, four-ish. Then I moved here. And in all honesty, I probably never thought of climate change whatsoever, which is kind of surprising because when I reflect back now, I could definitely feel everything getting <laughs> hotter and hotter and sort of the weather being more more crazier but sort of what sort of got you into sort of being concerned about the environment and concerned about climate change where did that all begin for you yeah well I was lucky because my mom worked for an environmental program so um SPREP uh, which is the regional environmental program that's made up of different Pacific Island governments uh and that's based in Samoa And so when I was young, my parents both worked two jobs. And so I never had like a babysitter at home and like my sister was at school or at tutorials. And so I would go with my mom to work. And when my mom would be setting up um, presentations or setting up the desks for the meetings, I would um, sit in and watch like the scientists and the people doing the presentations go through sound check. Mm. And so in Soundcheck, they would go through their presentations on the state of environment of the Pacific. And I would listen in as a kid to that. And and that's really where I got exposed to what environmental degradation is, um, what the loss of biodiversity was from like a very young age. Mm -hmm. I guess it was just the exposure to that type of language and that type of information that really um, like sparked a fire in me. Mm. So being exposed to all that stuff kind of... um inspired you Mm. almost so what kind of um degradation did you see growing up in Samoa because I'm guessing when we think of climate change when we think of change on a global scale it's usually quite you know small changes and over time it becomes a very big problem but what kind of stuff did you sort of notice earlier on in sort of which kind of led you to your journey working with the climate change warriors yeah well um the first time I heard about like the the term climate change you know that little shift from global warming to climate change i um i i always knew it to be something that was futuristic um and it was always like a phrase that one of the presenters said i remember it in their slideshow that said climate change could mean an island like tokelau not being around in the next 50 years and so for me it was like almost this um like dystopian future that we're looking at and i never thought that i would see what that would look like firsthand and then in my like late childhood to early teens I started noticing like more and more um like floods drought um I started noticing how frequent cyclones were starting to become and how big they were going they were becoming not just in Samoa but like in Tonga and Solomon's and Fiji um just the extent of of this these events I felt like were getting much bigger and um, I remember having a conversation with my mom and, and she said she experienced her first cyclone when she was 19. And and at that time, I had a nine-year-old cousin and she said she had experienced three cyclones already in her life. Right. And so it was just seeing that difference in frequency mm. that um, really opened my eyes. Like, well, this is not just the futuristic scenario. Mm. This is something that's happening now. Is there a big movement in Samoa? Um, for climate change? Are there a lot of people backing it and supporting it and pushing for change out there? Yeah, I would say there is a a, a big um, movement around knowledge of climate change and also um, adaptation to to climate change. I feel like our government, along with many Pacific governments, are quite uh, active in, in calling out the mitigation we need from bigger governments as well as the adaptation that our little islands need to make for mm. for climate change and i also feel like there's so many people in the islands that live sustainably like they live that life that that pakeo palangi activists want to live mm. and they do it not even knowing that that may be like the quote unquote environmentalist life like that's just mm. that's life. just culture right yeah. that's just how we've always been brought up that's just how we live and people look on it as like wow that's something so new but um for us it's 
our day to day yeah. life, right? So that kind of pushes a little bit towards um, your activism, right? So you saw all these things and you wanted to make a change. The question I have is because activism gets thrown around quite mm-hmm. a bit, especially over the last four years with Trump being in office, right? The word activism gets thrown around quite a lot. But what does that mean for you? Because a lot of people come with different um, reasons why they've become an activist and what it means. But that for you in particular, what does activism mean? Yeah, I, activi- like an activist was always a term that I was always scared to, to use. And so from like a young age, just doing environmental work. So I got into environmental work through my environmental group. So I, I used to have an environmental group in primary school and we used to do thing like, things like composting and recycling and we had our carpool registry for um, us that live in the same villages. And so I always labeled myself as an environmental advocate. Ah, and I so I, I always stayed away from activists. Like I, it always scared me, and I don't, I don't know why. Maybe I'm still trying to process why I felt like it was a scary word to label myself. I mean, they're not portrayed very kindly in the media, no. right? Because when you say activists on the news, it's people smashing things. Recently, anyway, mm. you know, there's a lot of sort of chaos, which kind of comes with activism in a way. A little bit of anarchy doesn't hurt, hurt a little bit <laughs> if you need a bit of change. But yeah, for sure, man. So, so you sort of decide to call yourself a climate change advocate as opposed to an activist. Yeah. And then in my later years, I started getting labeled as an activist. Other people labeled you as an activist. Other people labeled Mm. me as an activist. And I think the reason why is because I just spoke outside of the status quo. Um, And I think for me, activism, like it shows itself in different ways. Like for me, my, my avenue to activism has always been storytelling. Mm. Um, and a lot of people don't don't see that they they see activism like you said like you're out in the streets you're you're shouting for change you're screaming and I I always felt like um, just my personality type it's always mm. been more than just that it's like activism for me is like the policy work it's the storytelling mm. work it's the grassroots work it it's so much more than just showing up in the street with banners which is very powerful at sometimes but you know change has to go beyond the streets sometimes of course I think the, the the pro what would you call it protesting well i guess we can just use the word protesting because mm. i can't think of any other word to use it is important because it's it's your right to go out there if you're really mm. upset about something and especially if it's to do with the government it's actually a very powerful way of portraying that message and getting your getting seen and exposure but you're right on the other hand i think if you had to look at what really changes things is actually trying to work from a policy level mm. yeah because if anything, if all you're doing is just sitting there shouting nonstop with your banners, I don't think anything really gets changed. You know, that's my personal opinion yeah. on things, you know, but I think getting in there, having those conversations, telling stories, you know, about sort of what's happening at the moment and things that kind of get swept under the rug is very important. So I agree with you on that as well. So can you explain to me a little bit about sort of what you do in terms of being a climate change advocate? You kind of said, told, said about uh, telling stories. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I, um, I've done many things, like you said. Um, there's many avenues in which you can do climate work. Um, and so I started off doing grassroots work in Samoa um, and, and doing what I felt like was, like what I had access to, to be able to be more environmentally conscious and to, to really spread that message. And then I came to a realization really young that, as much as me and my friends wanted to be doing these environmental like activities, if the governments weren't moving, we're not going to see the change that we wanted. And so then I started getting into policy work um, and I started doing some of the, the UN youth work. Um, I started going to the climate talks, which I still oh, interesting. try yep. and go to. And what, um, what, what happens there at the climate talks? So it, it's where all the, the governments come together and they try and, and pull together an agreement on what they want to commit to for right. for climate action. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you always see like the big countries try and pull to the side of like not having to do much. And you see like countries like Samoa and Tonga try and like pull them to the side of you need to do more. Um, so I started attending those and trying to, to find my way to influence the way policy works and I guess learn more about it. Um, and then my storytelling work is really around um, spreading the word of climate realities, I think it's it's adding that human face to the climate situation. Uh, a lot of people don't feel like that connection to climate work because they don't 
see it as a human issue they see it as like a political or a scientific issue especially if you're not from the pacific Mm. um or even like if you're not from the like if you've never grown or, or been to the islands and seen it i feel like a lot of our diaspora young people are starting to now look for that connection to the islands through climate change work and i feel like okay. an entry to that is, is through storytelling is telling the stories of of what climate realities are in the pacific so what kind of stories would you be telling would be people who currently live in samoa tonga or, or Tokelau even and sort of say what what their experiences are or do you would you sort of be talking about your own personal experiences about going and visiting and talking to people yeah um i, I talk about my own experiences um, I, I've been in, in two cyclones, Cyclone Gita and Cyclone Evan, um, what it was like to see my land go. I am from a coast or most of us are from coastal villages, um, of Faleula, what it was like to see, um, you know, my land at Faleula starting to, to be drifted, drift away. And, and I also try and, um, try and help other people from the pacific tell their stories of climate of climate resilience of climate action um and reality Mm. and i've heard some really powerful ones from from tonga from from kiribati from all around the pacific Mm. okay so i mean that that is a very powerful thing to sort of put forward Mm. because there is that big disconnect from a lot of people's like it's not happening to me so why should i really care about it so getting people out there and when you watch someone and you actually can see because i think there's a video i watch of a time lapse of like a an island that where you can see the sea levels rising and rising and rising mm. i mean you just have to go to one of those islands at the right now and just see where old roads or old houses used to be built and it's all pretty much underwater and i think if you can get that message portrayed right and this is the whole marketing thing i'm guessing that yeah. needs to happen with with everything else you know you can impact and probably get more people on board more people aware you know, so what, why do you think people, I mean, aside from being that disconnected, you must talk to a lot of people who may be skeptics, who may be kind of, you know, they, uh, they agree that there's climate change, but, you know, not sure what needs to be done. I mean, how, how does that conversation start when you talk to someone and they're like, I don't think climate change is an issue? Like, what, what would be the first thing you'd probably have to tell them? Probably a slap in the face, maybe. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what would you sort of like bring out to sort of try and convince them that it is an issue? Yeah, I think I, at first it, it's getting down to why they think it's not true. Um, I feel like a lot of people as well, at least through my experience of having conversations with people who don't believe in climate change, um, it sometimes comes from like this place of fear of like the unknown, of um, of not wanting to admit this like very like inconvenient truth. Um, because if climate change was real, like it would be an inconvenience to everyone to have to change their life, to have to like, um, change the way that we've been living in like this consumer, like this consumerism that we've, we've like clung to as, as humans. Um, and so a lot of the times when I talk to people who deny about, deny climate change, it's because, um, they are very comfortable with the way they live their life and they don't want to change that. Um, some people, they, they just like truly believe in like some outrageous, or I shouldn't say outrageous, but in, in it, their their own. It probably is outrageous. <laughs> you, you know, you can't say it's outrageous. Some people are really stupid as well. You know, I can say it. I can say it's my show. Yeah, 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 it. yeah, you yeah, can yeah. Say it. But yeah, <laughs> you know what? Like people have like some really, um, yeah, outrageous ways of thinking like, mm. oh, if climate is controlled by NASA and then this and that. Yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then there's some people who who deny it because of religious reasons. Um, and, and that's a very common one in, in Pacific communities. And that, a story that or a way that I always like to um, have that conversation about religion is is we were put here or in the bible we're believed to be put on earth as stewards Mm. and so you know this land doesn't belong to us creation um doesn't belong to us it belongs to god and we're only here to look after and we haven't looked after it um and so therefore it's also our responsibility to fix the wrong that that's been caused by Mm. other humans with your work in the pacific Mm. how much resistance do you get from certain lobbyists certain government uh people there who are deeply involved with capitalism and the consumerism of everything. And I guess, how do you sort of get them to sort of see that climate change is happening regardless of what they believe, you know, because 
at the end of the day, not that I believe the government can fix everything, but I do think they're a very integral part of, mm. of starting and, and supporting the change that needs to happen. But how do you sort of talk to government figures? And I guess uh, it was a question that popped up when you're talking about the um, when you meet with different governments to talk about a plan and what they're able to commit. How do you sort of talk to a government, you know, like uh, let's give uh, Tonga for an example, you know, um, not the best in terms of uh, GDP. You know, a lot of our stuff is imported, you know. Uh, we do export quite a bit, but, you know, a lot of it is based around this capitalist system. And to a certain degree, if we sort of go with something like the Greens are trying to propose or we're trying to move away from that or any sort of um, climate activist um, groups where they want to sort of change the entire system, how do you sort of talk to a group of people who, in their minds, feel like they need this current system, the current system, to try compete with the rest of the world and yet we know with uh, climate change, it, they need to start changing. So how does that conversation, if, they, if you kind of get my, what I'm trying to say, mm. how do you start that conversation and sort of what kind of feedback do you get from it? Yeah, for the Pacific specifically, I feel like so many governments in the Pacific are actually um, climate leaders. They, they've like, well, most of our Pacific Islands, if you add up all of our carbon emissions, it, it contributes to so little mm. of of the world's um, global carbon emissions. But I feel like um, a lot of the change that's been happening, like with the ministries of environments and Pacific governments, is coming from a place of, well, if the world and these big co- um, countries aren't going to move, then we'll move and show them mm. what climate leadership looks like. And so um, I don't have those conversations with Pacific governments per se i feel like they're very much on the same page with with needing this climate action and i think that comes from a place of we don't benefit from the systems that cause climate change so we don't have like um investments in the the fossil Mm. fuel industry right um Mm. but we are living with the the front line of impacts of these types of industries so i feel like um we have more to to more skin in the game in the way that we need to defend um, our land and and speak out against these industries that have um, caused that makes sense um but I, I have come across a lot of like lobbyists that show up to these climate co- um, conferences and you know they get paid to come and try and give presentations on like clean coal and like how how that's going to be the future um and it, what it really comes down to money mm. and and to people um and I think that the more the global north um, have like these young people like Greta Thunberg, like be able to, to like stand up and and really unite with like indigenous what indigenous kids have been trying to say for, for decades and say, actually, if my like Pakea Palangi government is is still going to be involved in coal, like I'm going to go and stand outside of the government building and strike on every Friday. Um, and so so it's all about like that collaboration and that standing in solidarity to be able to really have a chance against like these lobbyists and, and these industries. So it's really more talking with big countries like mm. the United States, e- even New Zealand as well. So those are the countries that really need to sort of be the for- front runner for change, yeah. really, because it sounds like to me the island's already ready for it. Yeah. You know? Okay. So talk to me a little bit about um, the climate change warriors. So I've seen it sort of posted all over Instagram, and I know you've, you've, you're you've involved with them at the moment. So talk to me a little bit about what they do and sort of where that started. Yeah, so um, when I was young, very young, I um, entered an essay competition, and I wrote this essay about Samoa and the environment, and I got to go to this children's conference. Cool. Um, and at this children's conference, I got introduced to this group called 350.org, which is a climate, um, like climate activism, climate um, organizing group. And I told the, the workshop leader at the time, I said, oh, I love this group. I'm going to go home and start a 350 Samoa. And so that was the start of an environmental group in Samoa. And at the time, like me and my friends in our group, we felt like we were so small, like we were doing all this work, but no one was listening to us because you just cannot compare like a group of 20 kids to a group of like 50 kids in in like a bigger country, you know, or like even places like in Germany and in, in, in the US, they have like hundreds mm. of, of people show up to these events where there's so little of us. And so we were able to connect with 350 groups across the Pacific. 
um, and all of these these groups that were like in Tokelau, that were in Solomon's, that were in Niue, um, they came together at this global um, youth summit in Turkey, and they decided to, to form a coalition of 350 Pacific, okay. and then um, they called themselves the Pacific Climate Warriors. What, what's, what's the 350 um, stand for? So 350, it's the safe um, amount of carbon in the atmosphere that we can have. So um, the carbon in our atmosphere, uh, well, the emissions in our atmosphere is counted parts per million, and so we need to get down to 350 parts per million to be at a safe level that the Earth can survive on. So we've surpassed that. Um, I believe we're almost up to, we're in the 500s around that, that point. But um, the organizers who started 350 chose that number because um, 350 can be translated easily into any language. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So very inclusive. Yeah. So they okay. chose that. So what kind of work do they do sort of locally here in New Zealand? Like, do you guys hold rallies? Do you guys um, organize meetings? What do you guys do? Yeah, so our new, our Auckland um, arm, so we have one in Auckland and one in um, Wellington. Um, our Auckland one is, is still pretty new. So a couple of years old, we did a lot of work around the strikes last year. Um, and then this year with our Wellington um, fam, we held a campaign called Pacific Votes Count, trying to get more young Pacific Islanders registered to vote and informed about who they were voting for. Um, and it was a non-political um, campaign. Um, what I mean by that is we weren't backing any party or, or trying to um, tell people who to vote for, but we were just trying to get people to register to vote and to use that political um, you know, responsibility that everyone has to go cast the vote. And then um, we also did like a virtual um, tree planting this year. And so it's, it, it varies. Mm. We do whatever people who have volunteered for the group want to do that year. And then in 2021, um, we've yet to come up with a plan, but we definitely want to do um, more work around our community and, and awareness. Oh, that's cool. So I know you, you just said you guys aren't really a political mm. movement, but Obviously, with change, there needs to be some politics mixed in there. So with the, the recent elections coming through, with now Labour and Greens are now sort of in there, do they sort of, are they would, would they be the closest government to sort of support the stuff you guys are trying to push through? Because you guys have your own agendas. You mm. guys kind of know what you guys want to be pushing. Do those two governments kind of sit better? Oh, I, I kind of know the answer. It's better than national for sure. But like, do they sort of, do you think they'll be more attuned to sort of hearing you guys out and sort of implementing the change that you guys are hoping for? Yes. Um, so we, as a collective in, in Aotearoa, the Pacific Climate Warriors came up with a list of climate demands. So what we thought um, needs to happen in New Zealand for, for New Zealand to be able to claim that quote unquote, like good Pacific sister, right? Because we're we're always um, saying that we are like the Pacific neighbor to our islands. Like we're, we're this this almost like good older cousin. Mm. And so we put together this, this list of demands that New Zealand would have to adhere to to be able to, to gain that um, label. And um, Greens definitely um, ticks off more of that mm. um, of, yes. on our list than any other part any other party yeah is that i mean because i would just imagine the greens would just align with a lot of what you guys mm. want anyway because they're kind of pushing quite similar probably not exactly the same thing but very similar would you guys have a, a much more bigger push say for example um the kind of policies you guys would like to implement is that a lot more than what the greens are pushing at the moment or is it more or less the same i think for us what's really lacking in in some of the greens policies is um, or even just like the, the the government who who were in power and are going to continue to be in power um, is that representation. And so there's like this for the New Zealand government, they have a um, board for for climate work. Um, so a climate committee. And there was just a, a lot of just a lack of representation, especially for Pacific people. And it was just a bit tone deaf. Um, from our opinion to not have pacific people like new zealand claims to be the kava bowl of the pacific because there's the most pacific people here but they were lacking that representation on their climate committee and when questioned about it the they replied and this was the labor government that they were um they were recruiting based on expertise and not representation and that in itself is also a a little bit tone deaf because 
you're then saying that Pacific people don't have the climate expertise, mm. that we're just representatives. Um, and I, I feel like that's completely wrong. I know so many Pacific climate scientists, um, Pacific community organizers who've been doing climate work for decades and, and much longer than any like Greens candidate that I've seen. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, there's still that lack of, of inclusion of of marginalized communities in the Green Party. And I think they have a lot of growing to do, uh, you know, mm. just like any other political party. Yeah, there, there's no perfect political party. Mm. You know, I was talking with someone else. It would be nice if we can pick and choose different policies and then just smack it into one and then roll with that. But it, obviously that's that's not going to work. Yeah. And it comes with its own list of problems in itself. Yeah. So we kind of talked briefly about it earlier on, but there seems to be a confusion with people between global warming and climate change. Mm. So for as early as I can remember, when I could remember this conversation starting about sort of changes, global warming was the buzzword at the time. You know, I mean, people hit global warming and now you don't really hear it. Now we've kind of changed to climate change. What is the difference? What is the difference between the two? Mm. Um, so global warming, it's uh, the flaw in that, terminology is that it's only acknowledging that it's just the temperatures that's changing so the only thing that's happening to the planet right now is that it's getting warmer there's nothing beyond that temperature change whereas climate change it encompasses all the different ecological changes um or climate changes that that we're seeing in like the heat waves and in um, the sea level rising and the way there's like a frequency and extreme weather patterns. And so climate change is, is more of an all-encompassing um, phrase because it, it, it acknowledges that the change that we're seeing in the planet is so much more than just to do with temperature. Mm. Whereas like global warming, it's, it's very focused around the temperature of the earth and not entirely about all the changes that we're seeing. Because mm. it's not that they're saying it's not warming it's just mm. like you said it's very limiting so do they even use that word anymore is that something that still gets used from time to time or if they completely no we're not going to say global warming anymore because it's not representing the views climate change is what we're doing and what what's happening yeah i still yeah. hear like global warming mentioned especially with like older people oh, I that's think. it's probably because older people would be the ones yeah. saying it um but then you would get like this new generation of people who would who never heard it because they've changed like the terminology in like the textbooks mm. and so um yeah the only time i ever hear global warming news is when there's like an older person on the news talking about um climate or global mm. warming and and they'll use that but i feel like like this new generation of like millennials and gen z I've never heard them use that term. No, no. I mean, that just comes with the territory, mm -hmm. right? As, as time evolves, new terms get used, which probably explains more accurately what's happening in the world. And people start using that and stop using older words. That's just that's just the way the world works. Yeah. So we kind of already talked about the impact globe. Well, I was about to say global warming. <laughs> that does not make me old. <laughs> what was I about to say? Climate change. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about the impact climate change has on the Pacific Islands. Right. So I don't think we really got into the a little bit. We, we probably could just go with a little bit more detail about what specifically can Pacific Islanders do to sort of help mitigate that. So you kind of mentioned earlier that we are small, you know, small fish in a very, very big pond in terms of comparatively mm -hmm. to the United States, even Russia, all these places that hold China, even who actually are the main contributors of um of uh, I was about to say global warming again. <laughs> Bloody hell! Once it's in your head, oh, no, it's now, hard to get now it out. it's all global warming yeah. in my head now. No climate change, climate change. Um, you know, um, I think I read somewhere leading up to this podcast, like you know, what was the percentage of uh, climate change that human made, and I think it was like something over one fifty percent is like mostly related to humans. So, mm. putting that into context, and not to sound pessimistic, which I can be a lot, <laughs> you know, but. Reality-wise, what, what what can Pacific Islanders do who are at the forefront of getting the negative impacks of climate change? What can they do to help s stop that or make that better or have other countries hear what they have to say? What, what can they do? Hmm. I think when I think about um, those living in the front lines doing something, I always think about the communities in Kiribati because hmm. they've, they've modeled that in such a powerful way where – there's so much climate resilience happening in Kiribati, so which is one of, um, for those of you that don't know, is one of our atoll islands in the Pacific. Um, 
also one of the islands most impacted by um, climate change because they're only a couple of meters above water and no mountains to go to and so there's always like this saying around um losing islands it would mean like islands like Kiribati, Tokelau or Tuvalu going because of their size um but in the face of that reality people in Kiribati have been able to adapt to to the changes that's been happening um I know um one of my elders from the climate movement, her name is Pelenice, so we call her Mama Pele. She lives in Kiribati, and um, she's been like the the boss lady of of building these seawalls. Um, her and, and these kids in Kiribati have, have been building these seawalls for years now, and she has like this sixth sense that she knows when the tide is about to come in and there's a break in the seawall, and she'll go and change that. And so she, this woman has so much resilience, and, and she also dreams of building... Um, the most sustainable village in the world. Interesting. Um, and so she's in, in plans of building this with a, a few partners that she's um, met. And she wants to, to have solar panels and, and um, keyhole gardens. So keyhole gardens are the ones that are raised up the ground mm. so it, it doesn't get the salt water. Sea water, yep. Um, and she wants to have um, floating maniabas, which is floating fales. Wow. Okay. Um, and so she has like all these plans, and she knows that she she wants to change. And she's also been someone who shows up to these these climate talks and to these um nego- these climate negotiations and and tells the world, you know, these stories of Kiribati. Um, and so I feel like the Pacific plays such a pivotal role in showing the world what resilience looks like because essentially we're the canary in the coal mine, right? Mm. Like we're experiencing all of of this climate impact first but we won't be the last to experience it and so we can show the world what the worst case scenario will be for them but also how we've adapted to it because i I believe that there really is so many climate solutions within indigenous knowledge and the world and and its scientists and its its leaders haven't tapped into that as much as they can mm. that, that's an interesting stance to take for what's the name mama pele mm. yeah it's an interesting stance to take because not i don't hear a lot of people who are really pushing for awareness and climate change and stuff mm. to be already trying to adapt to the change that's already happening um maybe i'm just not as informed as i should be but you know this is probably one of the first i've heard where someone's actually looking to you know how to live with the changes that's already happening mm. right there's certain changes that won't be able to be changed now right so the like they're gonna we could change everything tomorrow and then the impacts are going to just suddenly disappear yeah you know? so how important it is is it that we in terms of adapting to the changes that are happening now because it's happening you know and my pessimistic side coming through again and i don't see any <laughs> any major changes through the people who are in power to make those you know uh decisions that would help actually push this sort of movement forward i mean how important is it to adapt and possibly live with the changes that are happening now mm. it's so interesting that what you said about you know you've never heard these stories um, and I don't think it's it's not because you're not informed. I feel like nobody hears these stories. And if I hadn't known, if like if I didn't have personal relationships to these people who are are like showing this resilience, I wouldn't know them either because the media is so specific. If you notice, the media is so specific with the stories they choose to tell of the Pacific. And so it's always in that lens of where victims drowning waiting for a handout they never tell a story of some six-year-old woman in Kiribati getting her you know getting up at 5 a.m and building seawalls I'm still reeling from the kingdom of ice story <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm still reeling from that <laughs> anything to do with the news and and islands I'm kind of just like oh, I'm turning off now yeah. yeah but that's very true very true um and so I think that's an, another reason why we don't really hear these these stories that can actually enrich our experience as as people trying to create change because there are people who've already done it, like you've said. Hmm. Um, in terms of adaptation, I know so many, um, and, and it's my privilege just being in the climate space and knowing these people, but I know so many people who have um, made like ingenious plans to adapt and, and do it on a daily basis. Um, and I think that we need to, to get to a point where we're not just telling the stories of adaptation, but telling this also the stories of, 
of the reality of of climate change and in the good and in the bad because we also need to mitigate i think it's easy for big governments to say oh we can just keep emitting because they're adapting to it like they're doing fine yeah um i think there was what's the big problem they've got floating fellas now (laughs) they should be all good yeah. So there was that, um, I think the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, I don't know if you ever watched, I think it was on the news a couple of years ago, maybe last year, where he said, um, don't worry about climate change, the Pacific Islands are going to be fine because they pick our fruit. <laughs> and so he insinuated that we're going to be fine because if their islands sink, they'll just come to Australia and pick our fruit. Um, and so and that's like a whole different conversation around like environmental racism. Um, <laughs> I won't start there. <laughs> but yeah, if that answers your question... There are stories of people doing this work, and and I feel like the gov- gov- big governments do know it's happening. They just choose to be blind, and I think they will always choose to not do anything until the people who vote them in tell them to move. Or unless they're directly impacted by it. Yes, yes. You've actually piqued my interest. I want to know about climate racism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now that you bring it up, I actually want to know. What, what do you mean by climate racism? Because I've never heard the term before. Yeah, so... Um, Climate or environmental racism is, um, it, it was a term coined in, in a lot of the African um, small communities who saw that big corporations or extractive industries didn't care about the environmental harm they did to them because they didn't really see them as equals to them being white. Right. And so um, it also makes you question when there's a cyclone in the Pacific, it hardly gets any traction on the news if, than if there was a hurricane in, in Florida. Um, or, you know, who we choose to really care about when they lose land. It, you also see it show up in the way, who have we chosen to be like the poster child of climate action, where there's been um, decades of indigenous young people standing up against climate change and standing up against the the hands that feed it and then years later like a little white girl from europe comes and everyone praises her yay um, yay for the palangis yeah, yeah and so this is where you juggle with this this idea of, of climate racism and a really clear case for this is the situation of marshall islands so marshall islands um was under the U.S. administration when um, the U.S. decided to use those islands as testing um, grounds for for their bombs, their nuclear Mm. bombs. And so they tested, I think, close to 70 nuclear bombs um, around Marshall Islands and on Marshall Islands uh, that were four times, three times as big as the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. So that's how big these bombs were. And why did they do it? Because... They, they were able to do it and they didn't care about what would happen. No one was stopping them, right? No one was stopping them. Um, and there's that element of racism there too, where they, these islands are seen as disposable. These people are seen as, well, if they get, you know, if they get harmed, it's okay because they're not American citizens, mm. right? And, and this was so clear in the way that they cleaned up their nuclear waste. So when the U.S. administration had done all the testing, they told the islanders, we're going to clean this up and we're going to put it in a dome. I know the case, yeah. And a part of this this cleanup, they also shipped nuclear waste from Nevada in in the U.S. And so they knew in their head that this waste was dangerous and they didn't want U.S. citizens in Nevada exposed to it. So they dug up all that dirt in Nevada and they sent it to Marshall Islands to be buried in this in dome. The dome. Yep. Um, this dome now is experiencing cracks in it because of climate change and sea level rise, and the U.S. is, is doing nothing about it. And so um, climate change is almost this way that like, um, these, these colonizers have pointed the finger to these islanders twice, right? Mm. I don't care about you, so I will bomb your island. I don't care about you, so I'll let your island sink. Um, and, and that really makes you question, you know, who is, um, who's privileged to survival and who is not. Mm. Yeah. The, the Marshall Islands one is an, is an interesting case because from my understanding that, uh, that dome wasn't actually built properly Mm. and up to standard. So I think there's a lot of leakage happening. There's a lot of negative impacts to their, to the islands, to the soil, to the people. So it's, it's a really, a, a quite a, 
catastrophe and an atrocity that's that mm-hmm. was done there and there's almost very little to no acknowledgement or support around it you know i mean aside from that when, when did i watch the documentary i think it was just on youtube i think my wife was um doing an assignment on mm-hmm. it and she kind of just we just watched it together and it's it's very those are one of the stories where if you put that to the forefront of something that we like oh damn you know that is that is something that's tangible that people can look at so talk about governments, right? Talk about governments and, and everything. For change to happen, what kind of systemic shifts would we need to see from a governmental level for things to actually have, speaking of tangible, tangible change in the, you know, in moving toward climate change? Yeah, I th- one of the big ones that um, in the Pacific wa- Climate Warriors we've been calling for for a long time is the end to the fossil fuel era. So um, pulling out all the investments in fossil fuel and um, investing in, in green jobs and, and renewable energy. And it, it's so hard, especially for big governments, to make those commitments because so many of their politicians are funded by the fossil fuel industry. And so when they're about to go into the elections, they need money to... to create these big campaigns and the people with that money to to give them are always the fossil fuel industry it's exxon it's Mm. it's shell um and then when they get into power you know you have to repay the kindness the kindness Mm. that was given to you and so it's insinuated doesn't it like they may be it may not be as obvious because that'll be bribing mm. right but yes there, there is a certain understanding between lobbyists and government that you know you do this for me and you may or may not wink wink do this for me you know after so it is a bit of a concern so just to play devil's advocate here just play devil's advocate here so uh, recently been sort of just curiosity of mine about sort of economies and sort of you know the growth of the world and the complete change of how we sort of interact with each other and you know money and all that stuff so speaking of the economy and sort of our reliance on fossil fuels Mm. a lot of the people who are in third world countries even more poor rely on these fuels for industry to try and actually lift their poverty level right so uh, so this is my thinking around that in, in a certain way just with the conversation we're having i can see why it's so hard for them to change yes i agree that there's a lot of money in it ridiculous amount of money i think money that people can't even t- imagine mm. that's backing all these things but i think having to put that aside which i know it's very hard to but putting that aside to a little bit i think there's a lot of stuff that's happening where people do need it at this point in time because nuclear energy is a bit too expensive not to mention all the risks that come with Mm -hmm. that i think if we had to look at renewable energy like solar energy wind energy and all that stuff it actually plays a very little percentage in terms of the amount of energy that's being produced in the world so how would we I guess, how would we change everything from moving away from fossil fuels, which needs to happen. So I agree with that. But how would we do that safely and where we won't negatively impact billions of people, you know, in, 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 a, in a very negative way by trying to implement these changes? And I don't know if you have the answer for that or have any ideas on it, but it's sort of something that I kind of think mm-hmm. about and have been thinking about leading up to our conversation today. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a big, uh, as you could probably guess, I'm a big believer in renewables. And I, I've been to the, these summits where um, like young entrepreneurs talk about these new inventions that they've made to make renewable energy more accessible, um, more efficient. And I just feel like we never hear about these people, right? We never hear about these young engineers that have given their life to, to make this sustainable way of living um, more accessible and, and easier for us. And I, do, I really do believe that it's there. It's that it's not being tapped into because like you said, fossil fuels is such an easy way for these people to make money because it, it burns fast and only a few people have access to it. Mm. Whereas with renewables, with the sun, with the wind, with hydro, more people in the world have access to that than coal. Mm. Um, And I don't think that a lot of people who work within these industries, like workers, know know that there is a life beyond that. Mm. Um, I I traveled to, where was I? Um, Poland. And, And they were talking about their coal industry. 
And one of um, my colleagues that I met there in Poland, he said that more people signed up for the renewable energy class in engineering than coal. Mm. And so these people that were graduating, they were wanting to go into engineering, um, into to green jobs more than coal jobs. Mm. Um, but the government shut the, the, the list down to only be like a few people could go into to renewables. Mm. And so I, I think that we can get there. Our, our economy can move into a green economy. And I guess that's the optimist to me. Um, and I just feel like even people who work within these coal industries, they're not being treated the way that they could be. And I think that a lot of them are holding on to like that $2 an hour where they could be earning more than that. Mm. I think the the biggest complaint, oh well, the biggest criticism I hear, it comes down to pricing, mm. right, and, and how expensive it can be, as most transitions will be at the very very beginning until it's fully implemented within our system. Is our technology that advanced now? Because you would have more contact with the inventors, the entrepreneurs, the innovators who actually are pushing for cleaner renewable energy. Um, is our technology that far and advanced where? If someone said we'll flick our fingers and switch everything, would it be sustainable in the in in our current sort of consumerist life? I believe it is. I believe it. We are at a point where we can move faster to renewables than we are right now. Mm. I think we're moving like so slow, <laughs> yes. um, and I think that we are equipped to at least make that like switch to fifty percent, then to sixty to seventy. Whereas now we're just Oh, well, especially with a lot of the bigger governments, we're just not making that switch at all. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be a very complicated change because any sort of because this is drastic change on a global mm. scale, as opposed to in each individual country is kind of making minor changes, which is probably what's going to need to happen anyway. So I guess from what I've read and what I've sort of seen quite recently, the biggest skepticism is it's a, you know, just, just the affordability of it all. Because that's kind of what it comes down to at the end of the day, right? I mean, there's there's a reason why people are still buying fuel, you know, gas cars and not electric cars, just mm. in terms of the, um, well, A, accessibility. There's not a lot of places you can charge your car, for one. But, you know, the other side is that it's just cheaper to run, from my understanding, a fuel you know yeah. a car that's, that's full of fuel so would there be a so this is going to be a kind of a weird question you know so forgive me if it this sounds really stupid as well so do you think in, in a sort of capitalist world which is kind of where we are now that we could use that system to change the way that we consume energy i think i think that we can i don't know if a lot of people on my end of the argument wants that mm. I think that um, a lot of environmentalists, or at least the ones that that are that I work with, want to move even past the capitalist world. Mm. So what? So what system would they be thinking of then? So for a more like circular, okay, um, su more sustainable, where people aren't having to buy the newest thing, mm. um, which is hard to do. It's a hard change to make, but. I feel like the system that you, you're talking about, capital, a green, like a green capitalist system, I guess, is what um, more people, if, what more people who are on the other side of of the end that I'm on mm. would would consider. Okay. Yeah. Because I think this is me being very, uh, you know, poorly informed. So this, so probably the best way to, that I could think of it doing is making it. Uh, well, having the incentive that clean energy is profitable, mm. you know, because I, I think I think it'll be easier to change the way that we view goods and using renewable energy as a good as opposed to a lifestyle, because as human beings, we do want new things. That's why capitalism is so popular, yeah. because it kind of just plays into the human emotion that I want this now. I want the newest and greatest thing. But if we sort of and I think it's harder to change that system you know, I'm sure someone will correct me, which people always do. You know, um, it's easier. It will probably be harder to change that view as a, a capitalist view on how we run the economy as opposed to changing our energy source. So I think I don't know what you think about having to where we sort of get to a certain point in on a, on a global scale where fuel is you know, fossil fuels are not as profitable as 
mm. renewable energy. But that then comes back to the technology, right? Do we actually have the technology that's going to provide that good where people will actually switch? And I think that's that would be one way of doing it. I'm sure there's multiple ways, you know, of, of, of what people would like to do in terms of steps to change things. But from a mindset point of view and from a person who I, you know, I, to, I do believe capitalist is a, is a pretty good system, mm. you know, um, but I think what we aim for and our views on what is profitable, what we can make profitable can change and make things a lot more better. Yeah. You know what I mean? 100%. Yep. I feel like there's also a change in what um, this new age of consumer, what they want. Mm. Right. And so um, an example of this is, is the company Ikea. So, um, the Paris Agreement, which was a part of the, these climate talks I've been talking about, uh, was signed by many nations on the commitment that they wanted to make to keep our uh, emissions below and our temperature of warming below 1.5. And a lot of governments said that they were going to commit to this. And then a few businesses committed outside of their government to this agreement. And so IKEA was one of the businesses that went to the UN and said that um, we're going to commit to the Paris Agreement and change our business model to make sure that we are keeping our emissions down um, where we're not bypassing the limits that the Paris Agreement has, has mm. made. And so they've changed um, a lot of their systems of operation and they've marketed this to um a lot of their their organization and so i went to a meeting last year in spain where the ceo of ikea spoke and he um said the the plan that he had for for this new um decade for ikea and that was one that was going to be more sustainable which also involved that marketing plan so that the world knew right mm. and so if someone wanted to go and, and shop for furniture as a, as a consumer they would choose ikea because of how sustainable they mm. work so that's what i mean about sort of changing how we sort of do business and i think that would probably be a more quicker and more impactful but then at the same time a lot of people are getting a lot of money from fossil fuels and how they run the industry. So then again, we run into that other issue. Mm -hmm. Like for them, it, for certain companies, you know, like Tesla, for example, who are very big on renewable energy and things like that, as opposed to a place like Shell, you know, yeah, like yeah. like they are the they are the fossil fuel industry. So what do you say to them in terms of how to change? You know, you wouldn't. You know, it's basically have almost needing them to go out of business. Yeah, to a certain degree. You know, for, for just for people like myself who've been living under a rock, I've heard of the Paris Agreements. Mm -hmm. what, what 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 exactly is in the Paris Agreements that the countries have uh, committed to? Can, can you give a rough outline of sort of what they've committed to and what's the aim and the end goal? Yeah. So one of the, the big things about the Paris Agreement was to commit to keeping global temperatures um, from rising above uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, in, in the actual text, it says keep global temperatures from rising above 2 degrees Celsius with an aim to keep below 1.5. Okay. And so for island nations like um, Marshall Islands, they ran a campaign that said 1.5 to survive because any temperature change, global temperature change that goes above 1.5 could mean the sinking of Marshall Islands. Mm. And so a lot of um, the governments that signed on, and it was the most governments in, in any environmental or climate treaty that have um, seen before, signed to make sure that they were making all their um, governmental plans, keeping in mind that they can't go above this temperature line. Um, and I don't know I'm not the best person to talk on all the other um, policies. It's quite a, a, a I lengthy can imagine. I can imagine. bit yeah. of, of policy. Um, but I do recommend to ask your lawyer friend to maybe <laughs> yeah. explain that explain to it. It's a very condensed version, please. Give me the summary of it all. Okay. So a lot of people talk about, you know, um, a lot of, uh, well, a lot of people want to know what can they do on an individual level? Because we've talked about what the government needs to do, what the activists are doing, what the people mm -hmm. who are in in that life trying to push forward, and they're doing it as a collective, right? But what can people do as an individual to help 
support the cause or help do their part to mitigate climate change aside from just recycling you know <laughs> and even recycling probably isn't really <laughs> the most effective way of doing it because from my understanding we aren't really recycling here in new zealand at yeah. the moment i read an article about that i think it was due to could we usually ship our recyclables out to japan was it china and they would recycle it for us because mm. apparently we don't have the infrastructure or the uh, equipment to recycle all our stuff. So now that that's no longer happening because I think they're inundated with their own stuff, now we're just burying our recycling bin, which is a big argument I'm having with my wife because <laughs> we're still always like, just separate us. Like, you know, they're just burying it all in the same <laughs> landfill at the moment. So, because it makes us feel better. Yeah. Mm. My wife is going to beat me up, which is this. <laughs> Um, but but what what can people do on an individual level, as little as it may be, collectively over time, that does make big impacts? I mean, what, what kind of stuff do you do to sort of help yeah. on an individual level? I think like what you said, those um, individual steps in lowering your own carbon emission, I think more than anything, it makes it makes you step into almost like this green state of mind where you're like, I'm a sustainable person now. Mm. And in some ways that like feeling good about being like a environmentally conscious person almost does this psychological thing for people to make them feel like they're a whole different person in the way that they are now responsible for the environment. And so I do recommend like the little things, mm. right? But also acknowledging like the keep cups and the metal straws will not save us. And a lot of that has been greenwashed by people to, okay. to that's interesting because that was a big push to just reusable straws and all that stuff so you're saying that that's not really gonna do much i think that's great like yes let's save the turtles like absolutely but they're not gonna it's like don't think that it will be our savior like mm. these these reusable cups and these re reusable resources will be the thing that fixes climate change because i think there's a misconception that like i just need to take my own cup to a cafe and i've done my part like it makes people here. feel good about themselves right it's like look yeah. at me i've got my reusable cup which i do mostly because i don't trust other people's cups more than anything <laughs> else so it's more paranoia and mistrust on my part <laughs> as opposed to being climate, oh, got you climate there. aware um okay so so we've put those misconceptions to the side. Yeah. So middle straws, waste of time. Um, but we, let's still do it. Let's do, <laughs> still, let's still do, still it. do it. Yes, yes. But just to just to emphasize the point, that's not really going to make the impact mm. that we would want to do. Yeah. So what would? What yeah. kind of steps would people need to do to have that impact? Yeah. Well, yeah. First of all, I feel like getting all the reusable things, it's like if you wanted to fly somewhere and you got in a plane, but you didn't buy a ticket. So like, mm. do you know what I mean? Like it's it's an action to get to somewhere, but you didn't do the most important part, which right. is to get which a ticket pay to for go. The ticket, yeah. um, I miss those days when people would buy me tickets to go places. <laughs> I know, or just going places. Just go, just oh, going well, places. just going places in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, well, something that I feel like people can do that they don't really think about is question where they're putting their money. And so a lot of um, our banks in New Zealand and universities in New Zealand invest in fossil fuels. And so just being aware of um, where you choose to invest your money because then they then take um, mm. parts of that savings to invest in fossil fuels. Right. And if you're someone who's concerned about the climate and concerned about what the fossil fuel industry does to our environment, you might not necessarily be someone who wants to be putting their money somewhere where then your bank is using it for these industries. Mm. Um, so boycotting certain stores, certain industries. Mm -hmm. um, Nate, what, what's a couple of stores where we, which would be worth changing over to? You know what I mean? Because obviously, I half lived my life in Countdown, back going back and forth buying stuff. Um, but what other sort of stores could people, now that we're sort of on that topic, mm -hmm. you know, where would people, do you have any suggestions, I guess is the question I'm asking, of where people should be um, engaging or spending their money? I don't have any right now. Okay. Um, I know for banks, Kiwi Bank um, mm. doesn't invest in fossil fuels. Okay. Um, so that, that could be a suggestion if you were thinking of, of changing banks. Um, a big one for me, because I, I'm a university student, I was at the University of Auckland, and they invested in fossil fuels. And so for a few, uh, my first couple of years, 
a group of us went outside the vice chancellor's office and we like protested all the time to, to divest from fossil fuels. And last year, the university finally divested. Wow. So it was a great win because... Congratulations, yeah. So a lot of, a lot of students, you know, decided that they wanted to stand up and say, well, we keep on giving you all our money and you're putting our money into an industry that could mean we don't have a future. Mm. And so um, the university changed up and divested and and that is an example of you know really using your power as someone who puts their money places that makes sense because it all revolves around money mm-hmm. you know capitalist system for you know <laughs> at yeah. the end of the day so how important is it and this is something i think not a lot of people do think about unless they do in that case they will correct me as i said people always love to correct me how much how important is it to realize that maybe all the positive steps that we take now, we may not reap the benefits of. And it's actually for the next generation. How important is that mindset going into this? Because a lot of people, and I'm thinking about human behavior and, and human expectations, is that a lot of the times we do things, yes, for other people, but there's also a part where we want to reap the rewards ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, So how, how important it is? And I can imagine this, is, this may be an important aspect of, of the work that you do and the activists that um, that are pushing for more climate change awareness. I almost said global warming. <laughs> um, how is it? How important is it to realize that it's you're not going to see any of the benefits of the work that you do? You know, I mean, in, in the sort of the ch- global change that you guys want. Is it important to sort of go with that mindset or sort of continue to think, no, I can I'm going to get something out of it in the end of the day? I think you can have both, right? I think um, because of the way that climate change is moving so fast that we will see like, I mean, just this year we had this huge bushfire, right? And then our skies went orange. And so I feel like a lot of us are coming to the realization that we will experience uh, climate, like this climate emergency in our lifetime. Um, But I also believe that we should have some level of empathy for our future generations mm-hmm. and i always look at it like how you would leave your house for your kids like if if you built this beautiful house and you were only given your lifetime to look after it like w- would you completely wreck it and then leave it for your kids and their kids to live in or would you keep it up to, to standard would you keep it up to par of the house that you would want your kids to live in and i think um, that's the mindset we also have to be in. There's there's a saying in, in my village where I'm from in Samoa is that um, the people who choose to weave mats, weave mats knowing that may, they may not be the ones that get to sleep on it, but their kids will get to. It's that whole um, service, mm. you know, to others. And I think that's an important part, not just with climate change in general, I think in everything yeah. in general. And I don't think if people had that view which a lot of people do a lot of islanders do yeah um, maybe maybe not um but it's more it's, it's you're doing things more for you more than yourself yeah. for, for more than yourself right especially yeah. if you have children even if you don't have children it's for you know people down the line whether it's for your village or for your community or whatever you're usually aiming to do something for them so we've actually talked about a lot of negative stuff that's happening <laughs> in the world which usually how this is how the show goes we we talk about all the crazy shit that happens in the world yeah yeah let's talk about some positive stuff Mm -hmm. tell me some positive things that's happening in the climate change movement that you're very proud of you you mentioned one already getting the university of auckland to Mm. no longer invest in fossil fuels which is a big thing i didn't realize the university of auckland gave two craps about what the students have to think (laughs) If, if if this covid change has anything to sort of to point out yeah you know what i mean absolutely so that that's a really big win and i commend you on that what what else what else things have you guys sort of achieved over the last x amount of years which you're really proud of yeah there's there's a few um the just a recent one that's coming to mind um there's a bank of korea that was invested in the adani mine in australia Mm -hmm. and so they were going to give a whole bunch of money to to build this coal mine on aboriginal land so the, the whole mine is controversial not just because it's going to um, further feed the climate crisis, but it's um, been built on land that a lot of Aboriginal people didn't agree to give. And so one of their main funders was this bank in Korea. And um, the group I'm a part of, uh, the Council of the Pacific Climate Warriors, we wrote a letter to the bank and we told them our stories of the Pacific, how this mine will impact us. And we sent it to them and they divested their money just through one letter. 
must have been a very uh, which w- very choice words in the letter. Yeah, and <laughs> and we were so shocked. I guess we weren't uh, expecting a win like this. That that fast that of a fast. reaction. Wow. Um, but it just shows that sometimes it, it's about the asking. It's mm. about the um, just like let's see where it goes. Mm. Like let's just put it out there, put ourselves out there, and let's see what mm. these people say and respond to. So that that was a recent win. Um, there's so much resilience work that happens um, in the islands, in, in Marshall Islands. I have a friend, he's a, a clam farmer, and oh. he's teaching um, young Marshallese. I just watched a recent YouTube video of him. I'll send it to you after this. Yes, please. But he was teaching young Marshallese kids how to um, cultivate their clams because of the changing ocean acidity and the pH levels in the coral. A lot of their clams are dying. And so what he's been teaching people is bringing these young clams out, waiting for them to mature to a stronger age, and then taking them back into the ocean to grow fully. Mm. And so through this program, he's been able to teach all these people how to be able to adapt to the changing oceans. Um, and clam farming is such an uh, important part of a lot of those villages' way to get money. Mm. And so this has been a way he's been able to adapt to that. Um, I know... You know, uh, women in Solomon who have been uh, at the forefront of doing the no plastic um, campaigns. Mm-hmm. And so they went no plastic and teaching all these young kids how to weave, which has been almost like this lost art in a lot of Pacific nations. Weaving, we don't weave anymore because we just buy like these, we these can cheap buy it. bags, yeah. right? And so um, there's been women in Solomon who have been um, rehashing the the art of weaving and teaching this to kids. And they've been weaving their own school bags and their own bags to take to the supermarket. Epic. That's amazing. You know, I mean, it's good to hear the the wins that you guys are getting, you know, because I think what only gets portrayed in the media, like we mentioned, is Mm -hmm. all the negative stuff or, or just basically a very brief rundown of you know, what you guys want, but no real context of follow-up or in-depth sort of discussion. So I'm hoping today was one of those discussions where we really got down to sort of what you guys are actually after um, and what you guys actually do, which I appreciate greatly. Do you have any other messages for anyone else out there? Like if they wanted to sort of get into being an activist or getting, you know, getting um, involved with the climate change warriors, how, how how do they do that? Honestly, just go online. I feel like we're living in this very um social media virtual world world, man this isn't real where we are now isn't real yeah (laughs) (laughs) so yeah send us a message online um if you're not in auckland or wellington um or even like new zealand we can try and link you to the closest pacific climate warrior group if you Mm. are wanting to join us if not there are other groups to join too like tiara fatu is is a a maori um run uh environmental group um there's greenpeace groups that there's so many environmental Mm. and activist groups out there and i encourage i kind of especially our pacific island young people to join because sometimes we don't see it as a space for us but man, like I've seen these movements be enriched by our Pacific young people, and I think that um, they'll be lucky to have you. Yeah, and it's it's a nice uh, perspective, I suppose, to uh, the usual Western mm. view on on what needs to happen for climate Absolutely. change. So, w- if people want to get a hold of you to ask you questions or to sort of ask you sort of what they can do aside from using you know straws, yeah, <laughs> yeah. metal straws. <laughs> You're, I'm guessing they can get you on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Yep, Facebook as well. Yeah, it will just Facebook. be Brianna Fruin. Brianna Fruin on both, and I'm on Twitter, so all three. Oh, excellent! I follow you on Twitter yeah. as well. I, I don't tweet, but <laughs> I read. I, I the try. Drama. Oh God, no, no. <laughs> Let's not get into Twitter. It's it's very traumatizing for me, and this time I'm only using it as like a just an engagement for the mm. podcast at the moment, which it's been going great so oh, far. I haven't great. gone into any arguments with anyone, so that's good. And Climate Change Warriors, we can find them all on Instagram mm-hmm. and, and the usual social the media Facebook, stuff. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you coming through, and um, I look forward to hearing bigger and, and, and greater things for the years to come. Thank you. I look forward to hearing um, all your other guests on the podcast. Awesome. <laughs>